Hey everybody, I'm Soledad O'Brien and welcome to Wisdom Across the Generations panel for HBO's Between the World and Me, based on the acclaimed book by ta Coates. And joining me now, some cast members, Joe Morton, Felicia Rashad, Kendrick Sampson. Nice to have you guys with me. Nice Thank to be you. here. So let's begin with a question that I'd like all of you to answer. And it really is around what did you find so appealing about this project? Anybody who knows uh, about this project is that it, it, it starts, it was a letter. It was the author's letter to his son that eventually became a book, that eventually became a play, that has now become a film. What drew you into the project? And maybe uh, Kendrick, we'll start with you. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, just that, thinking about the letters that I want to write to my future children um, and and hopefully, <laughs> you know, that they look more like the world that I envision um, we're fighting for uh, and, and understanding the time that we were in um, at when we started filming this and the time that we're in now even uh, and how appropriate it was, how we have a responsibility. There were so many people um, from Hollywood included in this, which, you know, uh, a couple of legends here, uh, Joe Morton and Felicia Rashad um, uh, being a part of that were, you know, I think so important. Hollywood has done so much to, to, um, perpetuate anti-blackness and 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 physical violence against our people and for Hollywood to to participate in the solution and and raising awareness as to um our experiences and what we believe needs to change I think is so important and I wanted to be a part of that. How about for you Felicia? Well, um uh, I had been invited to participate in the play but I could never do that because I was always doing something else. <laughs> and that did not please me. So when I received this invitation from Camilla Forbes to, uh, to participate in the film, I thought, oh, my fortune is with me. I love this work very much. I, I am very taken with the writing itself and the subject of mother because I have a son? Yes. And how about for you, Joe? Well, I did participate in the play, um, uh, both here at the Apollo and at the Kennedy Center. And it, uh, like Felicia, it was the writing, of course, that drew me. And I, too, have a son. And for those of us who do have sons, we have had what's called the talk. And a lot of this book is about just that. Um, the other thing that I really did enjoy about the writing, though, is his his how much he loves Howard University. Um, there's a lot of that in there. There's a lot of how he met his wife in there, and a lot about how his son was conceived. And I think there is that side of this book as well. There's also, uh, uh, and I don't know if it made it into the movie or not, but there is also some conversation about uh, why the term black is beautiful actually fits us as a race of people. Um, and where that comes from. And I think that's that's equally as important uh, in this project. You mentioned the talk. And for people who don't know, the talk is, uh, I've actually done a documentary about the talk, right? It's that idea that um, often Black fathers and sometimes Black mothers will sit their children down, often their sons, but frequently their daughters, and sort of tell them how it is, usually around policing. And when I did my doc now, probably 12 years ago, one thing that was so interesting to me was that regardless of socioeconomic status, I interviewed people who were literally being evicted from their homes. They were poor black Americans. And I interviewed middle-class people who were driving their kids off to college. And I interviewed very, very wealthy people. But it almost sounded like they were reading off a script, regardless of where they were socioeconomically, the talk was almost verbatim you know, when you turn 13, I sat my son down and I said to him, you know, and this is kind of the world that you're going to expect. Um, it seems, it feels to me that at this time, because of a host of reasons, white people are beginning to understand the concept of the talk, which I think really only black 
people really knew about it. Do you think that that's true, Kendrick? Are you seeing a shift in understanding what I think Tanisi was trying to explain, not just to his son, but to a greater audience? Um, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> There is a shift happening. Um, it's with, you know, what's going on, particularly today. Uh, um, I'm not completely sure what that shift is, uh, but there is, I think a lot more people for sure are aware of what the talk means, whether they agree with it or not. Um, but I, you know, I, I got the talk all through my life. It didn't wait till I was 13. I was, you know, we got some country. Uh, we was in the, yeah, we, we had my dad, especially from the time I was born. Um, I didn't think, I actually realized when I was, when I got much older that um, it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized my dad told me that if I touch anything in the grocery store that the FBI was gonna frame me. <laughs> um, that they were going to get my fingerprints. Uh, I didn't realize that that was just him trying to get me to stop touching things. Um, and, and, you know, there, it's a funny thing, but there's something deeper to it. Right. Um, but I think a lot more people are, are becoming aware of our experiences, whether they try to negate them or, um, or actually embrace and, and do their best to be a part of the change is, uh, I think yet to be seen. Felicia, as a mother, you know, one of the things is Kendrick told that story, right, about his dad, you almost feel like he's telling you that story because he's trying, I think, trying to protect you, right? He's got to tell you this big story because he needs you to really, really, really not touch anything in the store. And, right. um, and it's a protective device. And I'm curious, Felicia, if there's you know, things in your background that you sort of brought to this, that, that touched a nerve with you as you were reading through this script? It's what she says about her son having a family, you know, pursuing himself through education, having dreams for a future, doing everything right. And all it took was one thing. All it took was one act and everything was taken back. Isn't that something? The book focused on violence in Baltimore, the author's hometown, and it focused on kind of the very terrible reality of, of white supremacy. And yet it's not a depressing story. No. It's it's an honest story, but you don't, I mean, I, if I ticked off, I'm going to tell you a story that involves violence and some hatred and white supremacy, I'd, I think all of us would be like, mm, maybe. <laughs> I think we would have thought we'd all saw that movie already. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm curious, Joe, for you, um, what touched a nerve with you in this? What was the thing that you thought was going to be challenging or inspiring to have to, to get out? Well, I mean, I think it, it is all the things that both Felicia and, and Kendrick have both spoken about. I also think that one of the reasons, just to get back to your original question, one of the reasons that there might be a shift in the perspective on the relationship between black people and the white people in this country is when George Floyd was murdered, we were all stuck in our homes. We couldn't get away from the image. There was nothing to distract us. There was nothing to um, just put it in the back of our minds. We couldn't get away from it. And so suddenly, I think... A, a larger majority of white folk in this country suddenly saw what we had been talking about all along, but they saw it in, in the cruelest way possible. That man not only had his knee on that man's neck, but he had his hand in his pocket. It was casual. It was impunity. It was all of those things. And I think because of that one moment, because of that one thing, just as Felicia was saying, things began to change because now, now it wasn't just a myth. It wasn't just something black people have been talking about but nobody ever saw before. Now they actually saw it. And the world saw it. Yes. But George Floyd was not the first man who was caught on video being killed by police. But he was the first man, but he was the first man that we couldn't get away from the image. Trayvon Martin, we could, there's all kinds of stories. Who shot who? 
um, uh, Michael Brown, you know, did he actually reach into the car and try to grab the pistol? This was blatant. He was on the man's neck. This is a big man. This is a very powerfully built man who we listened call for his mother as he died. And we couldn't get away from those words and we couldn't get away from that eight minutes and change. So I think that really made people open their eyes and realize, oh my God. I mean, that and I was watching some of the protests and I actually saw a white policeman uh, approached by a white, older white gentleman and the white policeman pushed him to the ground and he began to bleed out of his ears. I'm sure we all remember that image. And it's things like that that I think made people just think, oh my gosh, there is something terribly wrong here. You know what struck me in that image was um, when the older man fell and you could see, right, blood coming out of his head. One of the officers, because they were all marching, leaned down to help and the person behind him, the officer behind him, shoved him forward like, don't do that, don't, don't do that. And that was a moment where it felt like very, um, that there's a certain callousness that I'm not sure that people had seen before captured, right? It's the, it's the hands in the pockets. It's, it's that, you know, that, that casualness and the callousness of someone's life, um, to me, were the things that really made that stick and made that, I think, very, very um, challenging. Talk to me a little bit about each of your roles in this uh, project. And then I want to talk about how it's shifted, because for many people, and the book itself was a, a New York Times bestseller, but it's, it's not the book translated right onto the screen. It's changed. So, Joe, why don't you start me off? Tell me about your role. Well, um, I was told I am the quote unquote father figure of the piece. Um, and I suppose that's true. I start off, I have the opening monologue about, you know, uh, now that you're 15, here's the news. Um, and I think for me, it was, again, you know, as if I were talking to my own son. Um, you know, it is the kind of thing. The one thing I did say, though, is that I thought maybe 15 was a couple of years too late. <laughs> mm. That that conversation should have happened earlier. But for whatever reasons, it happens then. Um, and so I think that was uh, that and the fact that, I, I don't know, maybe Felicia and, and Kendrick had the same experience in that uh, we, they shot in my house out and around my house. And I know a lot of the actors sort of allowed their um, living spaces to be used as locations. And so that made it even more personal uh, because it was here in the house. I'm Dr. Jones, the mother of Prince Carmen Jones, the beautiful, young, bright, inspired, open young man who's living his life driving around in the purple Jeep that his mother gave him for his birthday to see his fiance. And unbeknownst to him, he's been followed through three counties. And he's killed by a police officer. Uh, and his mother is a, is a physician. And he's been brought up, you know, in very privileged circumstances. He's attended private schools all of his life. When it came time to apply for colleges, he looked at Yale, he looked at Princeton, he looked at Harvard. He went to Howard. And um, no parent expects to get a phone call at 5 o'clock in the morning saying that your son has been shot, he's in the hospital. No parent expects a child that you've poured so much into to build a great life, to have it snuffed out in an instant. You just don't expect that. And on top of that, you don't expect that someone who could do such a thing to a precious and perfect life would go uncensured, unpunished. You don't expect that. And it happens far too often, and we don't always hear about it. It's been happening, and we don't always hear about it. But here it is now for everyone to see. You know, it, 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 it's very... It was very painful to relive Dr. Jones' experience of talking 
to her son's friend after his death. It was, this is, this is something that you just, your children are not supposed to leave before you do, and certainly not like this. Kendrick? So I, um, I read the, uh, pulled over in PG County, um, letter and and it was basically you know if you talk about my character i you know a young dad uh in reading that letter and thinking about you know uh at least the way i framed it in my head um my my nephew is about to start driving uh and funny enough refuses to uh he does not want to get a driver's license and I ain't rushing him. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, you need to at least know how to drive. I don't necessarily want you to be out there driving um, with all the things going on, but he's actually scared. He's scared to get in the Uber. Um, but, you know, I love him to death and, and um, I want to make sure that I do everything to save his life. Um, and so um, in, in reading that, that letter, uh, of being pulled over in PG County, I remembered my own experiences growing up in Houston um, and being pulled out of my car at gunpoint and um, and thinking that might be my last breath, right? Um, being threatened to, they're gonna kill me if I move or break my kneecaps, all kinds of stuff, being acute, accused of stealing my mom's car and thinking about my nephews I have 21, 22 nephews and nieces growing up in Houston um, in the same place, right? Uh, and what has shifted, um, you know, and just thinking about that and it was easy to connect to this, this letter and this experience of, um, you know, talking about PG County police and how they were the most murderous at the time and the most heinous and, and and that fear um, that settles in, and the and the determination to convey that to um, the importance of of that, um, and the danger behind it, and and all of that, and the love and everything to uh, your son um, or your loved one. I always felt a similar thing growing up, which is my parents both wanting to warn us. I'm one of six kids in an all white community in Long Island, but also trying like not to ruin their, my childhood, you know? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thin line, right? You don't want to scare someone and kind of make them so aware, right? That they're afraid to even think about getting their driver's license. But at the same time, you need to have a realistic conversation. Felicia, how did you, and maybe Joe, you too, how did you navigate that with your kids? Like, you know, I, I, how do you tell them enough to be safe, but not enough to ruin their childhood? That's such a very good question. You know, I, I, being one who came through her teenage years during the civil rights movement, I have to say, with the appointment of Thurgood Marshall to the uh, Supreme Court and so many astute people being elected to public offices, um, Somehow you kind of thought that things might have gotten better. That, you know, it was better because I wanted it to be. And then one day my son comes in and he says, Mom, this was in New York City. He was driving my car with his friend and the police stopped him because he was in this car, and he's this young black man in this car. And his friend had a soda that was down by his foot, and he started to reach for it. And Billy told him, stay still, don't do that. It's, it was heartbreaking that it's, so many things had happened, and yet this fundamental problem, this 
thing about fear that you have to live with all the time that's so diminishing and, and constraining and constricting hadn't changed. How about for you, Joe? I mean, I think it's clearly a delicate balance. You know, you have your life, which is you, which you can display in front of your children and say, here's what I've been through. But at the same time, especially given our particular circumstances, we are in a situation where we can send our kids to good schools and be in nice neighborhoods and the rest of it. So it's trying to balance out what, where you're living and how you're living with what all else is possible. I believe in the film, there is a scene where it takes place, everybody's in their car. So it's all about what happens when the police uh, approach you in your car. So clearly it's something that we've all gone through. But that balance on, you know, how do you keep your children happy and, and not afraid, I think is you just allow them to live their lives uh, without sort of pounding them over the head with, you know, don't, you know, don't be afraid to turn the corner, you know, or as, or as James Baldwin said, you know, um, if you see it coming at you, you don't run away because there's no place to run to. You might as well go toward it because at least that way you know what hit you. But I also I also kind of want to throw in there like like you were y'all were saying earlier, um, you know you would think that with all of the 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 um, themes that are addressed in this particular project that it would be like a depressing you know project when you talk about white supremacy and you know violence and police brutality and and murder and you think that that's you, you would think that that's going to be a very depressing thing, a very depressing book, very depressing project. I don't want to watch this, right? Um, but that is also our existence, um, in uh, baked into our identity um, of what has happened and transpired in this country, what happened to our ancestors, what's happening currently, and. I do not live a depressed life, right? I do not live a depressing life. I am not a depressed, you know, individual. Sometimes I do get depressed. Sometimes I have all types of nuances about me. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed with joy, right? And that's a part of our identity, um, which I, I believe that this project, you know, we're, you're usually either portrayed as superhuman or super... Uh, superhuman or, or subhuman, right? And we don't get those nuances in between. And I think what's incredible in this project and, and in conveying these experiences to ch our children and nephews and nieces um, is that it doesn't shy away from the truth and the reality to try to preserve that joy, right? Because we know we know that we can maintain, we can have that joy, we can have um, all of the different nuances uh, of who we are while still acknowledging the truth. Um, it is a nuanced conversation, but, um, but we can, we don't have to hide the truth from, from our children and from our young folks uh, in our lives. And to your point, what I found joyful and reassuring about this project was the author's journey to himself. Now that is amazing. And, and I think to address your question of how you prepare your children, as Joe says, you live your life because it becomes the clearest example of what to do. And knowing, knowing that your child is not gonna live his or her life the way you live your life because it's their life to live but you've certainly given a very clear example. In the work, there's this line, this is your mind. Oh my gosh, I hate reading things to a bunch of actors. This is terrible. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to read it the best I can. Um, this is your mind, your body, and you must find some way to live, right? This, this concept of that everyone has to just figure out how to navigate it. And I agree, I, I don't, it's not a depressing story. It's just a very real story. I thought it was interesting, Felicia, that, um, that Dr. Jones 
in the media, we often have like the good black person and the bad black person, right? And the bad black person, well, they deserve what they got. They, you know, and the good black person, they went to Yale and they were what private school for high school. Well, you know, they didn't deserve it. He he was a he was a, a student at Yale. You see it in, in news coverage all the time. And so I thought it was very interesting that your character, right, is this 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 family that I think journalists would say, oh, you know, they're the exception. They're they're the exception. This shouldn't happen to them. Um, and what usually follows is a litany of investigating someone's backstory, even when they're the victim of a crime. I thought that was a really interesting um, kind of window into how these stories are often assessed from the outside. I agree with you. I agree with you. It is a very interesting lens through which to examine a life. Uh, and it's a very, um, it's not the right lens. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the wrong lens. It's just the wrong lens. Yes, yeah, she's Dr. Jones. She was born in Opelousas, Louisiana. She was born in, in farming community. She was from a very poor family. She became a doctor, but it, it doesn't matter it's not about and it's it's not about your social economic status, and it's not about your it's not about your career, you know. It's really about humanity, and that's a greater question. What is the problem here? And the problem is the dream. How do you mean? That's what he says. The dream. When he says the, they, they dream that they are white, what is he saying? To me, when I, because I've been contemplating this, turning this over and over again, what does that mean? And I think the dream is that you are different. Somehow you've separated yourself from humanity. You are different. Your status is different. And that is a dream. Because that's, that's the biggest lie since the devil learned to talk. And people discover, I find, in very uh, cold, harsh realities, how they're not different at all when viewed through somebody else's lens uh, at, at all. A lot of this story is about wisdom and where you find wisdom. And I'm curious for each of you, where, how do you think about that? How, who do you have these conversations with? I find it impossible to have conversations with white people friends, to be honest, because sometimes I think they don't, they, they don't understand it. Um, I, I think when I try to have conversations, it feels like, you know, either there's a sense of, well, I'm sure this person wasn't a Girl Scout or wasn't a Boy Scout, right? There's more there that we're missing. Or, you know, yes, it's terrible and let's all just move on. And it's been interesting sometimes, especially in the wake of George Floyd, that I feel like I lean on my black girlfriends. <laughs> like, like I just need to walk through this one more time with you. Who do you guys go to for wisdom and clarity and just walking through these issues in your head? Well, for me, I mean, it's, it's either my partner, um, she and I talk a great deal, or it's my kids. I mean, my kids are in their late twenties, early thirties. I have one who's older than that, but I won't tell you how old she is. Um, and it's talking to them. Um, because they're coming up in the world. They are, they are looking at the world as their future. We're looking at it kind of in the rearview mirror. We've been through some stuff. I mean, we know what's ahead, but we've been through some stuff, and that's kind of what we're doing. They are coming up, and their view, just as Tanahashi says in his book, is not the same as mine, is, is, has a different sort of perspective to it. It may end up talking about the same sort of things, but from a very different place. And I think that is where uh, wisdom comes from, is sort of like making a good soup. You have to mix a whole lot of things together before you get the taste that's, that actually is appealing. Do you think uh, generationally, clearly, there's a different take just even on race and color and colorism and these conversations are so, so different? How do you see it, Felicia? Because as you said, you have you know, you're talking about Thurgood Marshall and some of the people you're working with on this project have been around for a minute and a half. 
<laughs> did you did you guys how did you navigate those conversations? Where do you see um, their interpretation as different? Is it is it better? I I don't know. Sometimes it seems intolerant. There's a level of intolerance there, and I think it's born of uh, of weariness because they look and see so many generations and say, oh, well, now that's enough of that. I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's just enough of that. It's an intolerance. And so more than anything, when I, when I speak to young people, whether I'm teaching a class or being taught by them, I encourage investigation of humanity more than anything else because I think that's that's the only solution. It's like if you can't see your own humanity in someone who doesn't look like you, who doesn't pray like you, who doesn't speak or dress or think like you, well, what are you doing? What are we doing? And that's the only that's the only clear solution to this that I see. But there's something inherent. There's something inherent about the mind and the way it functions that creates all these distinctions and apparent differences. Even though wisdom tells us that they're not real. Baldwin says that um, these are categories that are put up. I'm black so we can justify my slavery. Um, I'm gay so that some straight man can sleep with me and not feel like he's gay. I mean, we, we create categories thinking that we are doing maybe something scientific and sort of set, setting something up when in fact, those categories are meant to separate us. Um, it's just as Felicia says, humanity is the key that we all need to be dealing with and not how different we are. In fact, it's easier to see and quicker to see how similar we are. Yeah, Kendrick, I'd be curious as you're on the younger side on this. Um, sometimes when I talk to my daughters, right, who are mixed race and they'll say, oh, mom, you just are so obsessed with this stuff. You know, nobody sees color. And I almost feel like saying, as soon as you are out of college, you are going to see a different world. Like, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't, want to bring them down, but I, I spent a lot of time reporting on these issues. And I, I just know, yes, in your little bubble, in your moment in time, sure. But you're going to one day walk into the world and actually change those conversations. And so I'm curious if you think that younger people are just more optimistic, or do they have a, a completely different take on it? Or are they more understanding of some of the issues and how to get to a, a solution? You know, I think it depends on the young person. Uh, you know, I think that young people have been impressing me um, in, in a great deal in the movement space and really getting out there and um, making their voices heard, making their votes heard, um, showing up in record numbers and such. But there's also a lot of young people that were that, you know, in the same way that we have generational trauma, right, passed down, there's racism passed down. There's, I don't know if you've uh, seen, uh, oh man, now I'm gonna mess up. Um, uh, his piece, he's an incredible black artist and his piece is called Heirlooms and it's 2020. So I'm gonna Google it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know what? I like that you're Googling in the middle of an interview. Awesome. <laughs> this might be my first ever, and I'm kind of <laughs> loving it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, his, his, um, his piece, one of his famous pieces is um, uh, called Heirlooms, and it just shows um, Carrie James Marshall. Carrie James Marshall uh, has these um, lockets that have faces in them and they're in black and white. And then when you uh, stare at the picture long enough, you see that blurred out is uh, a, a scene of a lynching. And they show in these lockets and these faces um, uh, this beautiful jewelry that those white faces in that locket were watching someone get lynched and cheering on. This is a lynching 
uh, postcard that was sent out, right? Um, and thinking about a lot of these people, some of them are still in power. Some of them are definitely still alive. A lot of the people that you see out there that were spitting on Ruby Bridges and such, right, are still alive and they have children and they have, and their children have children, right? And did, and was, was that ever really addressed, right? Was, um, what, was that hate ever really addressed? Um, but you know, going back to to something that was was said earlier um, when uh, uh, Miss Felicia was talking about the dream, right? The dream, the f facade of 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 whiteness, right? And and or proximity to white supremacy or white or, or power, right? Um, is you know, I I feel really passionately about this because we've I've seen you know. Um, here in Los Angeles, Dijon Kizzy get, get murdered by police and he was um, affiliated with a gang, right? Ryan Twyman was affiliated with the gang, right? And we see people uh, consistently discount them and say that they don't receive, they don't deserve justice because of whatever affiliation, which goes back to my own, I, I had a privileged upbringing of, uh, and my mom is is uh, of European descent, right? White, right? And um, and uh, my brothers, some of my brothers did not. Some of my brothers uh, and cousins and uncles and such have different affiliations that uh, people would say so that, that they don't receive that they don't deserve justice if they were murdered. Um, and and that is a painful. Uh, a painful um, reality uh, that that a lot of people, our own people, sometimes uh, are convinced that only certain people receive um, or deserve justice. Um, and there's a facade of that I think white supremacy and capitalism teach us of being the individual and breaking through the glass ceiling. And the only way to do that is to shed our community. It's lonely at the top, right? We hear that all the time that, you know, you have you can't bring everybody with you. Um, and it pushes us away from collective liberation. It pushes us away to realizing that everybody receives justice, that these systems were not built uh, for us and that they also were not ever intended and should not be the judge, jury and executioner, right? Um, that that everybody received, de deserves dignity and justice and, and peace and um, the resources that they need and not factoring in what led people to join gangs? What led people to uh, those lifestyles? Even when you look at the case of George Floyd, George Floyd had a ding on his record. And then you find out, you go back and research, you find out that this uh, Officer Gaines and these folks in, in Houston that actually arrested him are now under investigation this year. And they sent uh, a letter about reviewing that case to George Floyd in January. Um, because they were reviewing oh, like thousands of cases that were um, uh, brought on by this particular unit that was so corrupt, right? And the whole system is corrupt. So we have so many things that inform our identity and our experiences in everything. Um, and, and I want to move away from, and, and I, I want to work, I'm working so hard to make sure that folks move away from um, defining who receives and who deserves uh, justice um, and, and, and to move away from that individualist uh, mentality and towards collective liberation that the only way we do come up is together. But you, you, you say an interesting thing, Kendrick, because after um, the killing of George Floyd, the number of sort of middle-aged white men who I think were really shocked and they said to me, I always thought that most of the people who were stopped by police, they just weren't a Girl Scout. That was a quote. It was said over and over to me multiple times, you know, that that there was, that the 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 cruelty was justified, right? Because they're not a Girl Scout. And, and in this particular case, over a nine minutes almost, they couldn't do that justification in their head, right? They couldn't connect that. Like, even if they're not a Girl Scout, what I just watched in on a video clip doesn't 
add up. And so I, I do think that's a really interesting plea, which is back to why I think Felicia's character is so important. I, I know media does this all the time. You know, let me tell you, I don't know if you know this about the victim, but they're not really a victim. Here's all the things that, you know, you might not know that they have done that might justify their own killing, um, which I, I just, I've seen it forever. Is, is the medium important here? This is now moving to television. It's been a book, it's been a, it's been a letter, it's uh, been a play. Do you feel like at this time when audiences, regardless of their race, are trying to understand some of these big and complicated and weighty issues, bringing this story to television is going to be really helpful and more accessible? Felicia, why don't you start on that? But I'd love all of you to weigh in on that. Well, television does enjoy a broader audience than theater. And uh, television is watched even by people who don't read. <laughs> like a lot of people who don't read, I'm going to guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think that because of television, this will get to a lot of people who may not have even heard of the book before and didn't even know the play existed. So, um, and it gives, and hopefully what happens is it gives people an opportunity to have a discussion. So that um, has been happening more and more recently. Uh, white folks can sort of turn to their black friends and try to have a conversation that makes some kind of sense after seeing something that they can respond to directly. Yeah, I think uh, more projects like this that show the humanity of folks um, on, uh, uh, well, the humanity of black people um, on uh, TV is necessary. And yeah, um, it's TV is, pervasive streaming services everything is now pervasive especially as we're stuck in our homes a lot of us are still under quarantine we're under the like fifth wave or whatever of covid and you know um in the same way that we were talking about earlier people are um in we're stuck in their homes not only just stuck in their homes watching george floyd uh but also watching their jobs go away watching uh, as Dr. Melina Abdullah would say, the world was cracked wide open, right? The, everything, capitalism was exposed, uh, profit over people in our healthcare system was exposed, and we were looking for solutions and not willing to go back and allow the, the grind of capitalism, the grind of servicing corporations um, and survival distract us from what we already know, but have to face head on, right? And I think that that's something with TV, when we're looking at something like this, that displays our humanity, that displays the issue in a very nuanced and beautifully written way. Um, but also I think, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying about TV pundits and framing of killings, like, I think we need more projects that show that you don't have to be innocent to uh, innocent to receive justice, to deserve dignity. Um, that 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 it's not only the innocent that um, deserve their stories to be told, um, and that deserve um, deserve dignity. It's hard to, I think, articulate a conversation about like finding your place in the world. I have a friend who's an executive this big insurance company, he was talking to his colleagues who are mostly not people of color. And he told the story, and he's a high ranking exec, and he told the story of hearing a noise down in his basement. He's a lovely man, super handsome, very gregarious, fun dude. And so he tells a story of walking downstairs to the basement and he sees the back door open. And he says, I hesitate because I'm trying to decide, do I call the police because someone maybe has broken into my house? Or do I say, if I call the police, they might come and kill me. And it was listening to him tell the story, happy, gregarious, super successful guy. I think it was the first time his colleagues 
began to understand the complicated conversation about like, what's your place in the world and how do you, how do you claim that place and how do you constantly navigate that? Like that's a, that's an insane thing to be thinking, right? Do I run the risk of inviting someone into my home who might kill me or do I just risk it with the someone who might have broken into my home and also might kill me. I mean, it's an insane conversation that in a lot of ways, like that is not an unusual thing for black people to navigate at all. So I'm curious what you guys think about this idea of having a candid conversation about space and taking up space and navigating your space in the world, because I think that ultimately is it what's at the center of this project. Joe, why don't you start us off? Taking up space, I mean, I think there's two things that sort of come to mind. One is in the individual, kind of what um, Kendrick was saying before in terms of collective um, liberty. I think that um, the civil rights movement basically took up a great deal of space to say, we will not wait anymore. We want our freedom now. Um, Felicia was talking about young people today being intolerant. I have a feeling that when we were all younger, we were very intolerant. Um, because we could not wait. We did not want to wait. Um, um, uh, and in terms of people's careers, just their sort of normal lives, I think what we have all been learning is that we just all just need to move forward without fear. It used to be that black folks were afraid to move forward because they were afraid of what other black folks might think of them and they were afraid of what they might be get, getting back from from white people or being sort of segregated in a way that, so, you know, you're one of those special ones, you're different than the rest of those black people over there. And I think that's, that's really changed. I think young people don't deal with that at all. And I think that what we've learned is the only thing one can do is move forward. It's funny, Hendrick said, you know, that things were cracking apart. 1987, James Baldwin said, um, something's beginning to crack because we're grabbing for things. We are holding on to whatever we can get. We are stepping all over our neighbors because we are panic stricken, because we don't know what we have done with this century, um, what we will have done, what we will be doing to this century and what the future holds. So people are in a panic stricken mode and something has begun to crack. And he, I think he ends that by saying, you know, the, the terrible thing is, you know, if you think my danger makes you feel safe, then something is terribly wrong. Anybody else want to tackle that? I mean, because I think it's such a theme of this entire project about kind of how you navigate your place in the world. I mean, that's ultimately starting with the letter, what I think um, the author was trying to tell his son, right? About who you have to, how do you live your life knowing all of these things that I'm going to tell you and inform you about? Well, you did say your place in the world, and the world is bigger than this country. Mm. So, thank goodness, sometimes, for sure. <laughs> yes, the world is much bigger than this country. I should say the world is much bigger than these social constructs of this country. Mm. Much bigger. Come on and, and preach. <laughs> yes. I think it's important. Uh, it's important to encourage people to experience that, that largesse of the world. I think that's one of the greatest gifts that was given to me as an adolescent. When my mother packed up everything we had, put it in storage, bought us tickets on the Greyhound bus so we could have the flavor of the thing and took us to live in Mexico City. We didn't speak Spanish and didn't know a soul. But all of a sudden, the world got really big. Kendrick, how about for you? Yeah, I, you know, you were asking about who we go to for wisdom and such. And I, I have a privilege of being around some of the most, the dopest and most amazing liberators in the world. Um, you know, uh, Patrice Cullors. Um, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Dr. Melina Abdullah, uh, co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, Rashad Robinson, 
um, from Color of Change, all of these really incredible, Tia Osho um, from Baji, Black Alliance for Just Immigration. So just seeing about, you know, I'm constantly being educated on the diaspora, right? I'm constantly being educated on the collective liberation movement worldwide and how all of our liberation is linked together and how we should support liberation movements, whether they're in America or not, right? Um, and how we connect to them and how we can learn from them. Um, and I think, um, I, one, one thing that I, that, that from our relationship that I'm constantly challenged, which I, I constantly challenge other folks to be in community and radical love of each other in our communities and figuring out what the root solutions are, getting involved in organizations um, with the things that you're most, that are, that are addressing the, the, the issues that you're most passionate about um, so that you can be challenged constantly. The first time I heard as, uh, uh, Ms. Rashad was saying, you know, there's no, um, when you, you talk about like, there, the, the borders are imaginary. When she's talking about social constructs, like borders are imaginary. The first time I heard that, I was like, what do you mean? There are borders. Um, and then I was like, oh, right. Somebody drew up this map, right? Um, you know, Texas, I grew up in Texas. There's all this Texas pride, right? And it's like, and then you find out how was Texas formed, right? Who drew these boundaries? Who, you know, in the same thing with the United States, same thing as we're like trying to build a wall at the border of Mexico and all this other mess, right? Um, when you, when some, the first time somebody, um, uh, uh, probably Melina, uh, said, you know, we don't need police. I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And then thinking about what actually keeps us safe. It, you know, I was like, what is public safety? And a lot of people now are talking about reimagining public safety, looking at budgets and how oppression is baked into budgets now, right? And all of this came from the defund the police movement and, 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 um, and the movement for uh, liberation for, uh, uh, from police murder, right? And abuse and, and, and such. Um, really thinking about what keeps us safe is I ended on we keep us safe, right? You think about the mothers and the grandmothers that sat on porches watching kids go to school. Um, you think about, you know, the, the teachers, it wasn't ever the police in my school that, that saved us. It was the teachers, you know, um, they shouldn't be tasked with that, but that's what happened. Um, and so, you know, if, if police kept us safe in this scenario, then fortune 500 CEOs would live in the hood, right? They would be fighting for spaces in the hood because ain't no shortage of police there. Mm -hmm. But the thing that actually keeps us safe is the things that you see in, in wealthy suburbs, right? Good schools, jobs, um, education, housing, and healthcare, right? And so those are the types of things when I'm like thinking about this social constructs and what people actually need all over the country to be liberated from poverty and white supremacy and such. Um, I go to my, my trusted uh, people uh, that I love dearly and I get, I'm re refreshed with this perspective and, and what Angela Davis and these liberators and Ella Baker have been fighting for for so long. Um, you know, and the last one, I know I'm talking too long, but Ella Baker specifically talked about group centered leadership. And I think that that is something that we have to, when we're talking about collective liberation, take on instead of this white supremacist, like, or, or patriarchal idea of, of what leadership looks like. It's a singular person and it, you know, um, as opposed to group centered leadership where realizing that the babysitter is, is a leader, that the tech person is a leader, that we need the cooks and the mechanics and we all have tools that we can utilize and push into this liberation movement. And if we all play our role, we all don't have to be so exhausted, right? <laughs> So, yeah, let me shut up. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's a great point. And I think, you know, you mentioned fighting for so long. So I'm curious, my final question to all three of you, what's the wisdom then that you impart to others who come to you? I mean, now that you've been through this project, and I think it's definitely been an emotionally 
you know, listen, it's a, it's a deep project. What's the wisdom, what's a piece of wisdom that you impart to others around their place in the world or, or what we should be asking for or thinking about as we move forward? Um, you're all different generations. So I'm curious how you think about that. And maybe um, Felicia, I'll start with you. You know, I really, I really encourage a more introspective thought. I really do, because I think if 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 I try to frame my life, my existence, about what exists outside of my own self, that's a mess. <laughs> that's always taking on something that really is not my own. I believe that I have within my own self a power to create an existence that I want and that I want to share and to inspire that in others. And that's how I live. And that's my space in the world. Hmm. How about, I, oh, I sorry. Go ahead. Allow, I can't allow it to be framed by external things. And that doesn't mean that I don't see them. That doesn't mean that I don't recognize them. That doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge their existence. It just means I'm not informing my existence by what that is. Kendrick, how about for you? If I was to truncate it, I would say, you know, leave it better than you found it. That's, I went to uh, this, somebody's grandma's restroom one time um, in, I think, Compton or uh, somewhere. And, and it said, there was a sign that said, leave it better than you found it. Now that meant wipe up the toilet seat and, you know, throw the <laughs> things in the But in, I sat there and stared at that. I stared at that sign and I was like, my life has been changed. <laughs> and now I think about it all the time, every time I go into a restroom especially, but um, I apply it to everything. Leave this world better than you found it, leave people better than you found them, Leave go into every situation, seek out the most vulnerable, right? and work to liberate them. Leave that space better than you found it. And when you are by yourself, you have to leave. I realized I wasn't applying this because I learned this maybe 14 years ago, 13 years ago, but maybe two years ago was when I finally was like, oh, I haven't ever applied that to myself. When I'm the only person in the room, right? I should be leaving me better than I, I, I found me. We should leave this earth Mother Earth better than we found um, uh, her, and and just thinking about our Creator and 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 connecting with um, connecting with others, you know, uh, I think that it's really important, and and I always do that through a, a framework of abolition and reparations, and that's when you're thinking about abolition, I think about this. Uh, a good tree, I learned this in church, right? A good tree bears, uh, a good tree, a bad seed uh, produces a bad tree, produces bad fruit. A good seed produces a good tree, produces good fruit, right? And so abolition is uprooting those bad trees, planting good seeds that are founded in care and accountability and love, um, radical love of our communities, right? And growing that and nourishing that. Right now with systems, we can think about like policing coming from slave catching. That is the bad seed that grows the bad tree and all the bad fruit is all the videos we see. Right. So uproot that, put the, a new system in place that actually is founded on care. And, you know, that, that you know, uh, it is all about de-escalation and restorative justice and um, and, you know, unarmed non-law enforcement. Uh, first responders to for mental health care uh, scenarios um, or mental health scenarios. Um, and that is a passion of mine. So, you know, uh, but with internally, it's uprooting the anti-blackness, the, the colonization, the, 
the patriarchy, the the transphobia, the whatever, uprooting, uprooting the bad habits, the greed, the all of that, the white supremacy, whatever it is, um, uprooting that out of yourself, the self-hate and such, and planting good seeds at all times, uh, I think is is really, really paramount to moving forward in the way that we should be in, in society. I think for both of you, great wisdom. Uh, it sounds like Felicia's saying systems don't define how you define yourself. And you're clearly saying systems can be changed and uprooted and replanted. They're not, they don't have to be permanent fixtures in our world. Joe, I'm going to give you the final word this uh, uh, tonight. Um, so wh what do you think? What's the wisdom that you impart to people um, when they ask you about navigating this world? Well, I mean, I think the things that both Felicia and Kendrick said are part of what we should be aiming at. I guess I start a little bit further away. I, I always start off by saying, instead of throwing rocks through each other's windows, why don't we try knocking on the door, having a conversation? Um, defining what the problem is in order to solve what that problem is. All the things that have been mentioned between for the share of Kendrick uh, have to be done as, again, what Kendrick was saying, in a collective way. It doesn't happen with just one person doing it. So the only way that we can do that collectively is to talk to one another. What a fantastic conversation. I so appreciate the time, Joe Morton and Felicia Rashad and Kendrick Sampson. Nice to talk to you guys.